So I would like to, at this time, introduce myself, uh, Janet Gibson with the Pilates Method Alliance Board of Directors. I'm the events committee chair and your host for this panel session this afternoon, uh, PMA Educates, the Pilates Transparency Project. I'm going to introduce my um, colleague, Barbara Laureate, who is also a board member and will be our panel host this afternoon. So I'll turn it over to you, Barbara. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, this is obviously a, 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 an event that um, manages to combine a few of my interests um, and my roles at, as a um, as a, a Pilates uh, teacher and enthusiast and member of the board of directors of the PMA and um, a, a teacher and scholar in the area of intellectual property law. Um, so I think this is a, a very interesting opportunity to kind of bring these areas together, and I'm delighted to uh, be hosting this event with two people to help us do that. So first we have um, Mary Kelly of True Pilates Boston, um, a you know, Pilates teacher and business owner who has uh, done significant amount of training, um, mostly in, in classical Pilates, and um, is also the defendant in the Rich Tone Design versus Kelly case in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, um, and also one of the organizers of the Pilates Transparency Project um, related to that litigation. And so Mary's going to explain to us a little bit more about um, you know, her experience and what the PTP is really trying to do. And we also have um, my colleague, Professor Robert Brownice of um, George Washington University School of Law, who is the co-director of the IP program there and a, um, an expert in copyright law, among other areas. Um, I think of particular interest related to this case is the fact that Professor Brownice worked on um, research that led to uh, or a challenge to the song Happy Birthday, which had been previously claimed um, as copyright protected by Warner Chapel. Um, and while you know, it, 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 there was some ambiguity in terms of what actually resulted from this, but, but the point is that the, the main point is that we now can all sing Happy Birthday or film singing Happy Birthday without actually paying a royalty for that. So um, this is kind of similar to the issue here where I think one of the things that the, what I see the PTP really trying to do is, um, is trying to preserve these archival materials and, and the sharing of vintage Pilates photographs in a way that doesn't put, uh, that respects that legacy, it doesn't put walls of property around it, um, it just allows the broader Pilates community um, from various traditions to celebrate and share those vintage uh, photographs that belong to this uh, shared legacy. So with that, I will um, pass it along. Uh, we'll start with some of these questions that I have. And again, as Janet said, we'll save some time, hopefully for some questions from the audience at the end. So we're gonna start with, um, with Mary. So just maybe if you could give us a little bit of background about how you began to have this interest in, in finding um, and sharing these wonderful historical Pilates photographs and then putting them on Instagram and then what happened uh, after that? Sure, thanks Barbara. Um, I guess I've always been interested in history. Before I was in Pilates, I was a um, researcher for a commercial real estate firm. So research and history and um, just um, old artifacts is always a personal interest. But when I started my business, um, I didn't really have a lot of experience with Instagram. Um, I was, I'm a small business owner. Um, I have no employees, it's just my own small studio. Um, and I created an Instagram account. And the purpose of the Instagram account had nothing to do with historical um, photos or history. Um, in fact, in a given year, maybe five posts or just a handful of posts would have would have would have maybe been something that you would consider archival or you know vintage. Um, so I posted like everybody does who has a studio, um, you know, events that were happening at the studio, people who were coming to visit, um, what my schedule was, um, what kind of classes were being offered. Um, so it wasn't. I didn't 
I didn't ever start out that my purpose was um, was history or, or, or vintage photos. My purpose was running a business. And as a result of that, there was an occasional, you know, picture of Joe perhaps. Um, and since Joe was the founder of the method, it didn't seem to me out of hand to um, maybe throw a picture in there once in a while, but it wasn't, it was, in, no, it was this, it was a, a, a minute part of what my business Instagram account was. Okay, so, so your initial um, Instagram account wasn't about sharing, it was about running your business. Um, but can you, can you talk a little bit about, uh, for those who are not familiar necessarily with the details of the, the pending litigation, you know, what, what happened as a result of your posting these photographs? Sure. So um, it probably started in January of, so I, I opened my business in January 2017 made posts throughout the years. In January 2020, I made a few posts that were um, of Elaine Malbin. Um, some people, are, most people are probably familiar with that. They're from the Library of Congress. I made three of those posts. And after I did, I seemed to get on Mr. Gallagher's um, radar screen. Um, he seemed to be offended that I had posted these. He made some remarks. And then um, after the third post that I made, um, what he did was he went back to the very beginning of my Instagram account, which was 2017. And from that period, January 2017 to February 2020, he reported me for copyright violation on 17 pictures. So you can see it's like it's a handful of pictures each year. It wasn't the gist of my um, entire um, account. Um, at any rate, he reported those. They were taken down. I didn't do anything because first of all, they were old, not really relevant. And also I was, you know, a, I was by myself. I mean, I didn't have any idea how to even um, dispute it if I wanted to, um, so I didn't. And then um, I think, again, like I was on his radar. There was a, there was a while I continued to post, nothing happened. And then in the fall of 2020, 2020, right? No, 2021, sorry. Um, he reported about three more. Um, one of them was an image that um, is was from a greeting card that Balanced Body sells. I had contacted Balanced Body. I asked them if they could use the image. They said, yes. Um, it's one of Joe and Clara um, in front of the Divana, which kind of looks like the spine corrector and he has his arms folded in. I mean, pretty much people have seen it. And I think it was, you know, I would post that maybe for Valentine's Day. Um, again, I wasn't, my, my, my purpose wasn't, you know, just doing historical photos. Um, that caused my account to be shut down uh, because at that point I was a repeat offender. Um, so I think I wrote a couple of letters to Instagram or tried to get in touch and that's pretty much impossible to do. So I just opened up a new account, my second account. And every time on the second account, since I had been shut down, I was a little bit more cautious and I cited where um, each of the posts came from. I had three posts on my second account um, two of them I had gotten from an uh, archive, a library at um, University of Maine. Um, those were taken down. A third one was a um, uh, driveway mural in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And um, that was taken down. And then that account was shut down as well. So at that point, I realized that <laughs> this just couldn't go on anymore. And also, I started to find out that the same thing was happening to other teachers. So um, in total, Mr. Gallagher at this point has shut down at least um, eight accounts of different teachers for different reasons. Some people get notices from Instagram, some don't. Some had one instance, some had many. I, I happen to have a lot. Some were shut down after just one post or, or maybe three. Um, so it started to feel like he was using what was a little bit of a lax process as a weapon against people who wanted to even talk about Pilates history or wanted to share these photos. So um, that's when I filed, um, I, I looked at it a little bit more carefully and I realized Instagram doesn't want me to write them a letter and tell them why I didn't think the um, takedown was just, that they have a very specific process. And there's, I think, four things you need to do. You need to tell them who you are, you need to tell them the date of the um, post and what the post was. They don't wanna know where it comes from. Um, I had to give them um, an electronic signature, and then the other thing is you have to agree that you um, will be you you will be you agree to be sued. 
Um, and if you don't agree to be sued, you can't file a counterclaim. So I did file the counterclaim and that um, initiated the way the process works. Um, Mr. Gallagher then had 10 days. And in that 10 days, he could either initiate a lawsuit or the account would be put back up. And that's the process. Um, he chose to um, sue me rather than let my account go back up. And um, I just, you know, I had 1600 followers. I, I wasn't a big, you know, um, Instagram inf influencer. Um, but apparently, you know, I don't think that's a, a criteria that means much to him. He just, I think he really wants to sort of squelch people from um, having the conversation. Um, and yeah. so that's. So you were, yeah, you had 1600 followers and those were probably mostly what your kind of clients and friends and, and people that you were, you know, reaching out to for your. For clients and friends and, and not teachers. I mean, you know, the community of teachers that, um, that either people who had come to a workshop at my studio or people that I had trained with, um, you know, just, I think if anything, it was more um, other professionals and if, um, then, you know, I mean, definitely more other Pilates instructors followed my um, Instagram than my clients. I mean, I definitely had clients that followed, but that wasn't, that wasn't the bulk of my followers. I just did quickly, I saw Bob nodding when you were talking about the, the process of communicating with Instagram over this kind of DMCA takedown um, safe harbor process. And I was wondering, Bob, if you just say a couple of words about that um, and how this, you know, Mary's description kind of comp computes as far as your experience and knowledge of the law in this area. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely the law uh, that um, a somebody who believes that they own copyright in something that someone else posted without authorization uh, can send a takedown notice. Uh, but that takedown notice is not the last word. Uh, the person who posted it can come back and say, no, wait a minute, I disagree with that. Um, and the process is designed so that that person uh, who's the poster uh, does identify themselves and make them subject to, to lawsuit. So it's basically a way to, if there's gonna be a dispute to channel it into a court where both the parties uh, can be heard. Uh, and um, that's exactly what happened here. Obviously it does put the burden on, uh, in this case, uh, Richstone Designs or Mr. Gallagher to uh, actually file a lawsuit in, in federal court uh, within those 10 days. But um, he did that, and that's not that's not unusual. Uh, I mean, it's unusual in some statistical sense. Most takedown notices, uh, the uh, the poster never responds with a counter notice, and it is not brought into court. It just it just ends. But in cases like this, where the the poster has a serious claim uh, uh, that um, that the takedown notice is wrong, that this is exactly how the how the process works. So, so we get to the point now that, you know, so Mary, you've, you've been sued in federal court and then you bring, as you mentioned, the counterclaims now, the, the counterclaims, I think I can summarize those as being related to saying, you know, asking the court to make a declaration that these, um, that these photographs are in the public domain and not owned by Rich Tone Designs or, or Mr. Gallagher. Um, so you are the defendant in that case, and you've brought these counterclaims, but can you maybe explain how, um, if you were to win on those counterclaims, how this would benef potentially benefit the Pilates community at large, and sort of why you think it's important uh, to fight this fight so that the broader Pilates community is able to uh, freely, you know, share these, these photographs and this archival material without worrying about being sued or having their Instagram accounts taken down? Sure. Um, I think it's an important moment. And I think what is happening now is not dissimilar to what happened in the late 90s with the trademark lawsuit and in, with the trademark lawsuit. Um, and maybe people who are new to Pilates, new instructors don't even realize that prior to that decision, which came out in 2000, people were not allowed to call what they were teaching Pilates. Um, they were certified by a Pilates program, but then they had to say that what they were doing was something else. And so to me, this is the same thing. Instead of um, trying to trademark the word and prevent people from using the description of what they do as Pilates, it's trying to 
um, um, keep us from sharing information. He's trying to keep anybody from um, having access to the historical records. Um, and so I think, you know, as a community, we are not going to learn, we are not going to grow, we are not going to understand anything better if we if we don't know where we came from. And I think, you know, even, you know, um, there are probably even some people who start out teaching Pilates that don't even know that Joseph Pilates was a person. So, I mean, if you don't know that Joseph Pilates is a person, um, you're using his name. Um, I mean, I feel like what's, what, what um, Rich Tone is doing here is just trying to co-opt somebody's legacy. And that just strikes me as a um, very problematic thing to do. Um, I think that, you know, we should all, we should all be able to um, have this. We shouldn't feel that there's a single source, a single arbitrator, a single um, gatekeeper. And unless you go through that gatekeeper and, and, and get his blessing that you, you can um, even engage in conversation, never mind um, posting things to Instagram. Yeah. So you, uh, Mary, you mentioned the, the Pilates trademark case. Actually, uh, Bob, I wonder if you might be able to, for those people who might be listening who don't know about that, if you could kind of summarize from a legal perspective what that um, Pilates Inc. versus current concepts is about. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in that case, uh, Pilates Inc., which was at that time owned and controlled by Sean Gallagher, the same gentleman who now owns and controls Richstone Design, um, the plaintiff in, in this copyright case, so uh, Pilates uh, Inc. claimed that it owned uh, trademark rights in the word Pilates for two different things, exercise instruction services and exercise uh, equipment. And it sued current concepts, which was uh, admittedly selling both exercise instruction and equipment using the word Pilates. It, it sued uh, current concepts for infringement uh, of the trademark. Um, judge Miriam Goldman Cedarbaum of the Southern District of New York, uh, a kind of story judge who, among other things, was a mentor to uh, Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, she decided the case and she issued a decision in favor of the defendant, uh, current concepts. Um, the court decided a number of different issues, but the most important holding and sort of most lasting holding was that um, the, the word Pilates is uh, as of 2000 understood and used by the public as a generic common name, both for a type of exercise instruction and a type of equipment for use in that instruction. Uh, and therefore, as she held, there can be no trademark rights in Pilates for those services or goods. And that reflects a basic principle of trademark law, that you can't stop competitors from using a word that people understand to be a common ordinary name for a good or service because everyone who produces that good or service should be able to tell the public that they're producing that things. Uh, and so one of the, the results of that principle is even words that were clearly first used as brand names will lose that protection if the public starts to use and understand them as the common name. So for example, words like aspirin, escalator, thermos, laundromat were all once brand names for particular companies but they lost that trademark protection because they became common names for types of goods. In the case of the word Pilates, it's not clear that it ever would have had brand name trademark status. Um, Pilates was certainly the last name of Joseph Pilates as I think probably everyone on this webinar knows, right? Um, however, as many of you know better than I, Joseph Pilates himself often used other names like Contrology uh, to designate his exercise theory and practice. And he certainly never tried to formalize any trademark rights in his last name by registering trademark right, uh, with the registering trademarks with the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, for example. Um, Judge Cedarbaum's opinion is factually very dense. There's a lot of detail, but in the end, she applies pretty traditional factors for determining whether a word has become a generic or a common name for a type of good or service. She looks at dictionary definitions, at usage in newspapers and books. It's survey incident, uh, survey evidence. And she, her conclusion is Pilates uh, by year 2000 has become a common and generic name. It's, if it ever was a brand name or a trademark, it no longer is. Thanks, Bob. So Mary, I mean, I think you, you can, now we can see how this is, well, a, an issue about copyright. Um, it, it, there, there, are, there are some similar themes. 
And one of the things we saw with the um, Pilates trademark case was really how it, it, it actually had the effect of bringing the broader Pilates community together in a way, kind of led to the creation of the Pilates Method Alliance, in fact. And, and so you say, you know, this is kind of another moment. And is this something that you're kind of trying to do with the Pilates Transparency Project as well? What we, yeah, I guess, well, even beyond the lawsuit, what do you hope could come from this? Yeah, the Pilates Transparency Project um, was born from the need. Um, I think I was probably a little naive when I signed the um, DMCA form and agreed to be sued. <laughs> I didn't really understand that that might be a six figure um, proposition and um, take a couple of years. Um, so that aside, um, the Pilates Transparency Project was born um, from the need to raise money for the legal defense, that plain and simple. Um, so it would it doesn't exist but for um, Mr. Gallagher. I mean, he he's he's the one basically that caused it to be created. Um, and so that's what we're doing now. Along the way, um, we had to, and, and we were we're trying to fundraise, and we're a bunch of people who all had our accounts shut down and our voices um, silenced. So what am I, what, you know, what are we gonna do? We, are, we don't have the social media account, uh, accounts anymore that we did and the followers that we did. So we're, we were sort of starting from scratch. Um, we created an Instagram account. So we were shut down from Instagram and Instagram is, is now our kind of major way of getting our message out. And I think as a secondary or even tertiary benefit, we've been talking about history and why history is important. And we've been sharing historical photos and we've certainly shared things that um, we have found along the way or that interest us. Um, we've been providing updates on the lawsuit periodically as we can, just so people are aware because you know people may have made a donation a year ago and then they'll say, hey, I donated to this thing a year ago, you know, what's going on? So um, so it's a way for us to explain what we're doing, but it's it's it didn't we did it wasn't set out with any other um, sort of mission other than to um, raise funds for the defense. Thanks. So actually now I'm turning towards um, Richmond Designs versus Kelly. Uh, maybe Bob can, uh, you could help explain to this audience the basis for Rich Tone Design's claim of ownership and the copyright in, old in these old photographs and your kind of assessment of the case. Sure, absolutely. Um, since this is, this is uh, unlike Pilates versus current concepts, which is a decided case, this is ongoing litigation. Uh, let me just start with a disclaimer. I'm not appearing here as an attorney for anyone. I don't represent anyone in this case. Um, and nor do I see it as my role here to give some kind of formal legal opinion on the merits of, of this case. Um, however, I can explain some very basic copyright principles and I can explain how those principles place some heavy burdens on, on Richstone design. And the first principle uh, really is just a burden of proof that a plaintiff who in, who's bringing a copyright infringement lawsuit has the burden of proving every element of infringement, including most importantly here, uh, ownership of the copyright. So if there's not sufficient evidence that the, the plaintiff owns copyright in the work that they're alleging is being infringed, then the plaintiff loses, right? Um, the first substantive principle I think is that copyright in a work is owned initially by the author of the work. So for example, the copyright in a photograph is initially owned by the person who takes it the person who's behind the camera and who pushes the button. So as a result, to claim that you own copyright in a work that you're suing about, you have to either claim that you are the author of that work, that you yourself took that photograph, uh, or you have to claim that you know who that author was and you obtained copyright in that work through some chain of transfers of copyright from the author all the way to you. Um, and apparently the only chain of transfers that Richstone Design claims is a series of transfers that starts with Joseph and Clara Pilates. Uh, I'll say something about those transfers in a moment, but for now consider this, right? The, the first thing that Richstone Design has to prove is that Joseph or Clara Pilates took those photographs or somehow they obtained copyright in the photographs from whoever did take them. That in itself, right at the beginning, I think is difficult to prove. Uh, Joseph Pilates is in many, if not most of those photographs. So, he most likely didn't take them. 
Uh, and I'm not sure there's any evidence that Clara did either. Apparently there's a woman in one of the photographs with a camera, but that turns out not to be Clara Pilates. In addition, many of the photographs looked like they were taken in a professional studio uh, or by a professional photographer. And there's no evidence that either Joseph or Clara Pilates were professional photographers. So that's sort of hard at the very, very beginning. Um, the second substantive principle of copyright is that ownership of one copy of a work, for example, one print of a photograph, is quite separate from ownership of copyright in the work, of all the exclusive rights uh, to make copies, to distribute them, to display them, and so forth. And my guess is that everyone here has some intuitive understanding uh, of this, because I bet that every one of you owns a copy of some book that has photographs in it. I even have uh, owned a copy of this book called Street Photography Now. Uh, which means that I own copies of each of the photographs in it. Does that mean that I own copyright in the photographs? If I owned copyright in those photographs, that would mean that I own the exclusive rights to reproduce, distribute, adapt, and display the photographs. And anyone who wanted to do any of those things would have to get permission from me. And of course, you'd say, no, I just owned a copy of that book. I don't own copyright in the book. So back to Joseph and Claire Pilates, it seems quite possible and even likely that they owned copies of the photograph in, in photographs in question. There apparently were some boxes of photographs in the studio at 939 8th Avenue. And ownership of those physical copies may well have uh, been in, in Joseph and Clara Pilates. And then they passed uh, to the 939 Studio Corporation, et cetera, and maybe even to uh, Rich Tone Design and Sean Gallagher. However, that in no way means that the copyright in the photographs was transferred from we don't know whom because we don't know who the photographer was. Um, and so that's a completely separate question, right? The fact that he, he Rich Sun Design happens to have possession of copies of those photographs completely separate from the question of whether somehow it managed to obtain the copyright. Uh, and then a third substantive principle is that um, especially since 1978, conveyances of copyright have to be in writing and signed. That's in the Copyright Act. So there are special formalities required to transfer copyright. Um, and as far as I know, there's no evidence here that anyone ever was conscious of or focused on conveying copyright uh, in the transfers that occurred from Clara Pilates to 939 Studio Corporation, et cetera, um, it, it, there, was, uh, there were explicit, some explicit mention of some trademarks. So people were thinking about some intellectual property because they had some explicit language about trademarks. There was never any mention of copyright. Uh, so, you know, just to sort of return to the, the heavy burden, there's, there's a pretty heavy burden um, to show that who the author of the photographs was, who was the photographer who originally owned uh, copyright in those photographs. And then there is an additional burden uh, to show that the copyright was ever transferred uh, by that person on to uh, Rich Tone and, and John Gallagher. Um, and, you know, I get it, 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 we're still under litigation. Uh, and uh, the, the court has not yet made findings of fact, uh, but it, it, it strikes me that those are pr both pretty heavy uh, burdens to carry here. Now, I think that there's a, sometimes we refer to this you know, public domain, and there's this argument that you know, some older photographs, and we'll just talk generally, not even necessarily about the photographs in these cases, that, that, that older photographs would be in the public domain. Um, and, and maybe, uh, and of course, there's a, this can vary depending on whether it's published or unpublished. And so, so maybe you could just explain a little bit about that and what the public domain is. Sure. Um, well, so the, the public domain uh, simply refers to uh, that kind of space in which uh, 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 copyright is not owned anymore, uh, if ever. Uh, by anyone, and so uh, works are freely, um, you know, able to be used and enjoyed and copied and distributed by anyone. Um, and 
uh, as you suggested, right, works that were, were published a long time ago uh, are absolutely very clearly in the public domain now, right? Every, we can all co copy Mark Twain's novels, for example, um, because they are no longer under copyright. Um, the, there's a you know, thin um, line here uh, to the claim that these, these older photographs uh, are still under copyright and not in the public domain. Uh, as you suggested, um, previous to uh, 1978, uh, copyright in works that had never been published uh, they, the copyright, that copyright was actually indefinitely long, like it did not have an end. The um, uh, copyright, limited copyright term only started upon publication. That changed in uh, 1978. Uh, and now all works, unpublished or published, have a limited term. Um, however, um, given when these photographs were taken, uh, and my guess is that most of them are taken in the right 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and maybe early 60s. Um, those uh, those photographs would, if they were unpublished, uh, still likely be under copyright. Um, and if they were published after 1978, um, still likely be under copyright, just because uh, copyright has a a long term now. Um, uh, the, the basic term of copyright is, is the life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, and so when you think, well, whoever the photographer was, uh, did that photographer die more than 70 years ago? Uh, and the answer is quite possibly not, right? This, however, does go back to the, the uh, I think what will be the court's doubt uh, about uh, finding uh, copyright in, in Richstone Designs when we don't know who the photographer was because we don't actually know how to calculate when the copyright goes in the public domain. Um, so that's another kind of- uh, So this is what we sometimes verbal. call orphan works, right? Orphan works in the intellectual property space. So Absolutely. Many of, yeah. So even if protected, so many of these might be would be considered orphan works. All right. So let's. Uh, that was. Thank you for that. That um, description, Bob. Now, one of the uh, hobbies or interests that I do share with with Mary is um, we both enjoy. Uh, and actually, and Bob. I'm oh, sorry. And Bob as well. We all, all three of us, we enjoy historical archival research. It's not for everybody, but I think we, I can say we all kind of, we like it. So <laughs> I was, uh, and I know that Mary, you've been working on, on, you know, you went up to universities of Maine and worked in those archives and, and, um, and, you know, one of the, the, or some of the photos of Joseph Pilates that are at issue, um, as you point out, were taken by Lindquist, um, and so we do know the author and, and the, the, uh, the photographer of those photos. And of course he died and left his copyright to Harvard University. So those photos we do know are actually the copyright is owned by Harvard University. Um, so just in your travels and your visits to archives, um, what would you say, uh, do you have a, a sort of favorite find so far um, in your Pilates historical research? Um, can I have two? I think I can allow that. Okay, thanks. Um, I think before the lawsuit, the, the series of photos that um, I was most excited about was the ones that were at University of Maine. And I, I never went to University of Maine. They were available in their digital collection. Um, and they were, not only were they just in the digital collection, but because they were there and I contacted the librarian, she actually made, gave me the high res versions of them and made a special Google folder so that anybody who was interested could have them. So she made them very available until um, Mr. Gallagher called, contacted them and had them stop. But at any rate, the reason I loved those photos so much is they were on the wall of the studio that I trained, which is True Pilates New York. It's also known as Dragos. And it's the pictures of Joe standing in the snow and at various ages, in his 50s, in his 60s, in his 70s, and one, the last one is at 82. And because I had you know, trained there and those photos were always on the wall, I wanted them on the wall of my studio. So that 
I was very excited to find that I could have. Um, but since the lawsuit, I'd say the most um, exciting find was at Harvard, finding out that the um, George Huntington Hune, who was the, and I hope I didn't butcher his name too badly, um, who was the photographer for Return to Life and a friend of, of Joe's, um, had taken a number of um, photos, including the one for the image called Around the Clock. And I can show it to you. I think I can show it to you if I can figure it out. This is a replica of Around the Clock for anybody that hasn't seen it before. Um, it's an exercise. Um, there's videos of the exercise on YouTube. There's this image. Um, but this image has been the subject of takedowns. I had a t-shirt here, I'll show you. I had a t-shirt that I didn't make. Somebody who has, was licensed by Mr. Gallagher made it and gave it to me as a gift. This was one of my takedowns because I had a photograph of a t-shirt. Um, okay, that was one. Um, somebody else had a, um, was threatened because they were making an image of the, a replica image of themselves as the model in this same configuration, same exercise. Um, they were prevented from doing that. The woman who made this replica um, poster that I have, um, her website was shut down, her sales were um, stopped. Um, I know somebody else who had um, an around the clock um, takedown. So this one became for me more important. And um, I did find that it was at Harvard in the George Hunning and Hewn um, tear sheets from 1943. And the tear sheets are basically a photo album of all of his work for a given year that was published in various magazines, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, blah, blah, blah. But this was the first page um, in that um, album. And it was, it was exciting to know that George Hunning and Hume was the photographer for this image. I mean, before it was this we'd seen the image, it had been copyrighted in 1943 by Joe, but the copyright has long expired. And the basis for taking down multiple people's, you know, efforts to try to share this photo is sad, really, <laughs> it's sad. Um, and I think this, this is the type of thing, this is the type of thing I think is important for a few reasons. I think sometimes we talk about this division in Pilates of classical versus contemporary. And you could see somebody doing an exercise and somebody could say, well, no, that's contemporary. If somebody did the around the clock exercise, somebody could look at it and say it's contemporary. Well, no, it's, it could be, somebody else could say, well, no, we have this historical information that it's not. And does it matter whether it's classical or contemporary? It doesn't, but we should still be able to reference that, no, this went actually all the way back to 1943. There was a brochure that Joe put together um, I'm not gonna get the wording right, but there was some sort of benefit that he was providing to the war effort at that time. So there's a whole history of not just the image, not just the exercise, but what went into the brochure that um, Joe had created based on George Hunting and Hume's um, photography. So claiming that, well, the claim that anybody else has the copyright to that to me seems a little suspicious. Yeah, so that allowing you know people to have access to this, it, you know, it allows us to have discussions, to to have debates, to to you know talk about what and to just to learn more for its own value and it's the intrinsic um, interest in in knowing where this um, you know method we all love in various forms came from. Um, so I, that's right. great, Mary. Thanks. Uh, so we, we do have a couple of questions, but I just do want to ask Bob one more kind of to explain one more kind of legal question, uh, just because there's also this issue that comes up a lot, um, particularly it's, I know it's a complicated um, and, and to a large extent unsettled legal doctrine, but this is the idea of fair use that sometimes even when something is protected by copyright, you can use it in certain ways and have it not be infringing. So for those um, in the audience who might not be as familiar with the details of that, maybe you can give a quick summary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, fair use is a kind of safety valve. It says that even if uh, someone clearly owns copyright in a work, that if there are some uses that um, don't really affect the financial interest of the owner uh, and that do something useful for society, um, that uh, the, the use should be, should be allowed, should not be um, subject to uh, the exclusive rights of of the uh, of the copyright owner. 
Um, that is decided, it is decided on a case by case basis. It is the result of, of weighing four factors. Uh, and so it's um, you know, a little hard to have clear rules about when a particular use is or is not um, a fair use. Uh, but there are certain kinds of uh, uses that are, you know, everyone would agree was a fair use. For example, uh, what what Mary just did. So suppose that contrary to actual fact that uh, there still uh, was copyright in the around the clock illustration um, or photographs, uh, kind of edited photographs. And, um, uh, you know, the question would be, well, in a webinar, can I quickly show uh, the photograph uh, to somebody, you know, to, to, the, to the webinar audience to, um, in a discussion of what a copyright lawsuit is about. Uh, and, you know, I think 99.99% of, of, you know, judges, scholars, that would say, of, of course, I mean, that's not even a question um, that a, a, a quick display of that photograph for an educational purpose is in no way going to undermine the owner's financial interest in that, um, in that photograph. Uh, it's serving a valid educational purpose. So it's um, it would be deemed a fair use, right? And you know, I'll give you an example that's not just a flash of a display. Um, a publisher that many of you probably know by the name of Dorling Kindersley published a, uh, a historical book about the history of the, the rock band, The Grateful Dead. And they included in that book, small size reproductions of some um, vintage concert posters that were used to advertise Grateful Dead concerts back in the late 1960s uh, and early 1970s. And um, the, uh, the owner of copyright in those posters sued the publisher and said, um, we own copyright in those posters. You can't even put small thumbnail reproductions in your book uh, recounting the history of the uh, Grateful Dead. And uh, the court ended up deciding, no, that's, that's a fair use, right? Those were very small reproductions. They really didn't affect the market for the original poster and its size. Uh, and the, the original purpose of the poster was to advertise a concert, uh, to be a commercial advertisement. The, the purpose in including in this book was to provide historical documentation. So weighing all these factors, Small reproduction, not full size, different purpose, the court said, fair use. Thanks. Okay, so let's, so we got a couple, well, we got a kind of a question and a comment in the Q&A section from the audience. So one uh, comment was that uh, it's important to note Instagram does not ask for proof in the original demand to take down. Um, so, so that was uh, just a, a comment there. And then a, uh, we also have a question here. So Mary mentioned the posting of a photo that Balanced Body used on a postcard and that that, po that photo that you had posted of the postcard, I believe was taken down. Um, do you want to speculate as to why Balanced Body was, and so, and Bob, I'm not sure you read Balanced Body is what is now current concepts. Um, or sorry, yeah, what, what, what current concepts current is, concept now, right? is now, yeah. 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 Um, so, 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 can you speculate as to why Balance Body is not being sued for use of that photo? Did Balance Body pay for rights to that photo? Uh, I, I, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if you do. I certainly don't know whether Balance Body has oh, rights. I, I mean, to the photo. Mary, I don't know if you do either. I mean, um, I don't know. If you know, I had to guess. I would say no. Um, and then the question as to why they're not being sued, I can't answer, but I do feel that I was being sued because I was a small business person, I was alone, and there was not a belief that we could do what we've done, which is basically create a movement. And so, again, uh, credit Sean for the creation of the Pilates Transparency Project, but as of right now, there's been 933 donors. That is understated because some of those donors actually represent fundraising classes. So there are, some of those could be two or 20 or more. Um, and we've raised $112,000 um, for a goal of 150,000. And so here's my plug. 
um, <laughs> we need we keep, need people to keep donating and we need to keep this happening. But um, I mean, I think I, I, it's, it's a serious answer to your question as to why I got sued and why Balanced Body didn't. I mean, I think most people could put two and two together there. Yeah, I mean, there's also the, the perfectly uh, rational response that having uh, lost to current concepts, you know, now balanced body, why would <laughs> maybe a little hesitation to sue them again, having lost once, I don't know. Uh, but it is pure speculation, we can't say. So another question we have here is, all right, so I guess, uh, I think if I can summarize what, what I think the, the question is aiming at is, what are the possible results of the lawsuit? So what would happen, I suppose, if, if Rich Toe were to win? What would be the implications for the broader Pilates community? What would be the implications if you, and particularly your kind of counterclaims, were to win? What, what, what would be then the result um, as far as you know, the, the protection of those vintage photographs and, and images and um, uh, from kind of Pilates history. Of course, that's a lot, it's a lot of different possibilities, so. I, I can't answer the question as to what would happen if, if he wins because there's so many, so many of my takedowns are, in, are materials that aren't even in things that he had um, included in his copyright registrations with the copyright office. So his claims are very broad and they go beyond, you know, even things that are specific, were specifically registered. But I think I can answer what will happen if we win, which is that this will be settled once and for all. He's going to stop, he's going to have to stop chasing people and telling them that they can't use his image. He's going to have to stop going after people and telling them that they want to use the image, that they have to pay him licensing fees because he does that frequently. Um, and we'll all just be able to, you know, move on and share and these things will be in the public domain and, and we're looking for, we're looking for this to be settled once and for all. And if, if there were, if there was one thing, or if there were 10 things, I don't think there are, but if there were, that he had copyright to, great, let us find out what those are. We will not go near those and we'll just work with the stuff that we can. Nobody's trying to take anything away from him. Nobody's trying to prevent him from doing what he wants to do. We just want him to stop um, going after people with what I believe are false claims. Um, he can continue to do his workshops. He can continue to sell his posters. He continue to do whatever, but he's gotta be able, he's gotta stop claiming that he owns copyright to stop that he plain and simple doesn't own copyright to him. So I think that that's, this is that it kind of lays out to why um, you know the Pilates Method Alliance you know, decided that, that this was an important kind of uh, cause to, to support because even though it, you know it is you, you are the name Mary you are the defendant on this lawsuit um, the implications one way or the other the the possible results one way or the other um, could have this far far broader um, impact. Um, in, you know, on the, the Pilates community as a whole. And, and so, you know, it, 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 you know, we think it shouldn't have to re all rest on your shoulders to, um, to, to represent, you know, this broader Pilates community. So No, but, you know, you reminded me of something else, which it isn't this discrete um, collection of photos that I had taken down, or even a discrete collection of photos that Mr. Gallagher might be claiming copyright to. There are many people who have private collections, um, you know, and those people are afraid to do anything with their um, with their um, collections because they're afraid of, of of the repercussions or, you know, um, they, they there's so there's a cloud hanging over all of us. And so I think the other thing that will happen if we if we win is we'll we, we'll start to find out what some people have that they've been just sort of holding on to because they didn't want to go through the hassle of being harassed by somebody who's um, known to um, enjoy litigating. <laughs> So that actually just raised me a, a smaller technical question that I just think would be useful for Bob to touch on is that, you know, you can have a, a whole bunch of old photographs and you can put them together in a book, you know, if, if it's a, you know, they're public domain, you put them together in a book, you include some ex, you know, ex explanations, some additional material, table of contents, and you, so you might be able to get um, a copyright in a compilation of those photographs that you didn't take as a photographer. 
Um, so can you explain how, how far would copyright in a compilation extend versus copyright in photographs themselves? Sure. So uh, I think, as you mentioned, a, a compilation copyright is based on a selection and possibly an arrangement of materials. Uh, and so um, the, the only uh, infringement of a compilation copyright would, would be if somebody um, distributed the ex very same selection and arrangement uh, of photographs or other materials um, as the, the person who originally did this selection and arrangement. So for example, I have here from a, a long time ago from college, um, my Norton anthology of poetry, right? And uh, there's apparently a gentleman by the name of Alexander Allison who was the editor and so who chose which poems uh, to include, but also the order in which they were uh, presented in the Norton anthology. Um, but he didn't own copyright in, and he wasn't the author of, he didn't own copyright in any of those individual poems. Uh, and so reprinting any of those individual poems does not infringe copyright in the anthology. Um, the only thing that would infringe copyright in the, uh, the compilation copyright in the anthology is reprinting them with the same selection and arrangement. So I guess that um, uh, Sean Gallagher uh, published something called the uh, the Joseph and um, uh, the Joseph H. Pilates archive collection photographs, writings, and designs. Uh, and so, if you somehow reprinted those photographs in the same arrangement, the same kind of pages and order, same selection um, as uh, Mr. Gallagher did, uh, then you might be liable for uh, infringing his compilation, but reprinting any of the individual photographs is, does not touch the, the compilation photograph, uh, copyright, right? Any more than reprinting one of these poems in the Norton Anthology would infringe the uh, copyright in the anthology as a whole. All right, well, we just saw we had a bunch more questions come in, but I think we're gonna have to, uh, we have to end at three. So I'm going to turn it back over to Janet. And I just, I will say first, my, my thanks to our two panelists. It was really very informative and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. So thank you very much. What Can we questions and answer them later? Yes. I'll save them, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you all. Um, I'm seeing some of the commentary and some of the questions are saying thank you for the great conversation, great concept. And Mary, thank you to you for what you represent in terms of the Pilates industry and just copyright and, um, and trademark law overall. So thank you. Um, just a reminder, as always, um, the Pilates Method Alliance is um, co is sponsoring this forum, but all proceeds are going to the PTP, Pilates Transparency Project. If you have not donated, please do. I think um, this hour, if it's done nothing else, is demonstrate the risk associated with not prevailing in this case for Mary. And um, finally, if you're not a member of the Pilates Method Alliance, please consider joining us. It's this type of content and others that enables us to um, really drive themes and education that are directly related to the Pilates method and its um, prevalence. So thank you, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.